Yo, yo, what's up everyone? Welcome to Life Study Library. This is your boy, Lai Yosh. In this channel, you'll be able to learn about these interesting and potentially life-changing knowledge about science and psychology. So if you're interested, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to Life Study Library. So have you ever choked? Not as in something got stuck in your throat, but as in you not being able to perform at an event that you were certain you were going to be successful. Think about it. The time when you were performing at your ballet concert, or when you were shooting your game deciding three-pointers in the basketball game, or in a test that you were certain you were going to ace it. And then the moment of truth comes and you actually failed at something that you were so confident at. You practiced so much. How can this happen? You just choked if you were ever in this situation. You failed at something that you were for sure were going to succeed. It's not like you underperformed at something that you were not comfortable to begin with. It's different. Choking seems so impossible to happen, to you of all people. And yet almost everyone has experienced at least one instance when they choked. This happens to everyone who participates in a performance of some kind, and even the top Olympic athletes or world-class performers are not immune from it. And looking at all this madness, it's easy for the audience to conclude that the performer or the athlete was mentally too weak to perform well, and deems the performer incompetent, as if they themselves have never failed in their life. But all that aside, many scientists throughout history have thought that choking is strictly human behavior. Because when you think about it, all this practice and endeavor that humans put into whatever they were practicing usually does not matter when it comes to their immediate survival. It would be a big problem for, let's say, zebras to choke and forget how to run fast when being chased by a lion because forgetting how to run and escape means certain death for the zebras. Humans forgetting how to perform well in a physical contest, for example, has much less chance of having to do with immediate survival. We have the luxury to choke in a lot more aspects of life than many other beings, and hence, choking is in many sense a human trait. Another theory as to why we choke is thought to be because humans have a complex brain system and therefore a lot more errors tend to occur, particularly with becoming emotionally anxious, which is also a trait that is limited to humans, or at least have a disproportionate amount of. Humans can become so anxious of our performance that it pretty much cancels out our time and effort of practice. There are way too many instances where we got so nervous that everything that we learned prior just gets thrown out the window. This should be familiar to almost everybody. Nonetheless, failing to perform at a crucial moment is a common thing among humans and animals. Ever seen one of those Planet Earth documentaries where the antelope gets ambushed by the lion and gets eaten because they let their guard down when they were supposed to be looking around. This is an example in the natural world where organisms fail to perform something that was supposed to be natural to them. If you've paid attention to what was said until now, you might have thought, if things like this happens in the natural world, then the answer to all of this must be within the primal brain network of the organism rather than something emotional. Does everyone get that? I'll give you another example. When it comes to reward and pleasure, also something that is primal to all living beings, both humans and animals show similar response in terms of behavioral and neurological manner. My point is that the need to perform our best at crucial times are a common theme among the natural world and in the human world. So in order to learn how to prevent ourselves from choking, we can learn a lot by looking at other organisms. So now we're going to talk about the study. The study is done at Carnegie Mellon University on 2021. The study used monkeys and made them perform a simple task that came with a reward when they succeeded. As the study proceeded, the monkeys showed an interesting behavior. As the amount of the reward, the sugar water in this case, as the amount of the sugar water, the reward increased, the performance of the monkeys and their success rate increased as well. And as they continued performing the task, the monkeys showed clear signs of mastery or at least improvements in performing that task. However, here's the interesting point. Once the amount of the promised reward increased to a certain point, in this case when the amount of the sugar water reached 10 times the original amount, the monkeys started to fail in their tasks, and even failed repeatedly afterwards. This seems a little odd, right? Now put yourself in their shoes. Let's say you are a performer of some kind, and you're performing this choreography in front of an audience, and you're rewarded by their praise. 
During each trial, the number of audience multiplies, so the reward of a praise from one audience becomes two, and then two becomes four, and then six, and then eight, 10, 12, 14, and so on and on. You're very skilled at performing your choreography, and you feel increasingly motivated to perform well as the number of audience increases, and your actual performance also becomes better and better each time the amount of the reward increases. But then, when the amount of the audience becomes exactly 10 times the original amount, you begin to fail, repeatedly, even though you're supposed to have gotten used to the performance by now. But despite you trying, you keep on failing and failing until you crumble on the floor in embarrassment. Okay, I'm gonna stop it right there. I don't want you becoming too depressed. Anyway, that was what basically happened at the end of the experiment. It showed that a challenge with a disproportionately high stakes deteriorates the performance of those sample monkeys. And the study claims that this phenomenon is also seen by human performance as well. And this is something that we call in the human world, choking. At this point, the study has one question that remained. While all this is happening, what is going on inside our brain? Some people might quickly come to the conclusion that choking occurs because you are mentally weak or you weren't 100% confident with what you were doing, but is this really the case? The researchers updated their study by doing the same exact thing but this time inserted electrodes inside the monkey's brain in order to further examine their neurological activity. The results showed that a part of their brain called the motor cortex was intensely reacting towards the reward as the amount of it increased. The motor cortex is the region in the brain that is responsible for the planning and the control of various body parts to perform certain tasks. When you want to walk, it develops a plan, for example, which foot to start off, and then it signals the body and its specific muscles to move in a certain way, and then goes back to the cortex to receive feedback. According to the study, the motor cortex and the many cells that made up the cortex responded and activated to the increased amount of the reward. As the difficulty of the tasks increased, the sample monkey's brain also experienced an increase in the task management process in their brain. And of course, this is helpful, so it's a good thing. However, the whole process deteriorated when the potential reward level went too high. This supports the finding in the study perfectly, as you experience a disproportionate amount of stake in the task, it deteriorates the task management system in your brain, leading to failure, often at a crucial moment when it matters. Using reward to command action is a good thing, but there is a limit. And there's more. The researchers also observed how the sample monkeys failed at their task as the stakes sharply rose. When all this happened, almost all of the failures ended up being as underachievement rather than overachievement. What they analyzed from this finding is that failing to perform at a crucial moment isn't about these people having weak mentality or any of that sort. Well, I guess it could be one reason, but, but more importantly, it is because the disproportionate amount of reward disrupted the motor planning. And because your brain doesn't have a concrete plan anymore, you freeze in place, unable to initiate any movement. Simply put, this doesn't happen because of an emotional problem, but because of a neurological problem. I gotta make sure this message gets to you because I know that failing to perform at important times often destroys people's confidence and motivation, and it would be such a waste of potential if something like that became the final blow to you deciding to quit that activity. I feel like this is another one of those really, really important psychological and neurological information that you should absolutely know in order to promote fulfillment in your life. You didn't fail because you were mentally weak. Take a look at all those worldly famous uh, basketball players or worldly regarded chess grandmasters or the CEO of that international conglomerate. Despite being regarded by so many people as the kings or the queens of that field, they still can and do fail, and often at very important times in their career. I know that this entire thing will not become a good excuse for you to not put effort into your endeavor. Like I said earlier, of course you need a great amount of time and effort put into that whatever activity you're doing in order to see improvements. And if some kind of a reward appears because of your hard work, oftentimes it's better to take the reward whenever you can than to not. 
But from a neurological point of view, that reward being too important or too life-changing for you might give you more negatives than potential positives. And failing to do something you thought you were so good at is of course devastating to your confidence. So this is a big problem, isn't it? This is a really tough issue to tackle because rewards are definitely a great source of motivation, whether that's an immediate reward or long term. So taking away the entire concept of a reward will most likely not help, right? If there was a sports tournament or an exam without any reward attached to it, whatever that may be, you can pretty easily see how most people would not be motivated to participate in that. Unless that activity is so vital to your identity that you're able to continue doing that without any reward, then it could be different. But for the most part, you'll most likely quit at some point if you don't see fulfillment in some way or if there are no stakes attached to it. It's just like how a horse won't start running unless you put a carrot in front of them. And the study points out that if you show him 10 different carrots, the horse will most likely try to run to 10 different directions, at random of course, when you want them to go to just one direction. It's important for team leaders at a company or a volunteer organization to know how this all works so that your effort to lead and manage a team won't go to waste. So here's the important question. If rewarding your teammates or subordinates, if rewarding them in some kind is a risky tactic to motivate them, then what's the better alternative? My answer to your question is to stop relying on external motivation and start using internal motivation. If you want to know what these are and how you can use them to better manage and motivate your workers, teammates, or even your kids to work harder and endeavor in that whatever activity, and ultimately have more chance of coming out successful, I'll be making a few videos that talk about stuff like this. And so in the meantime, if you feel like you need to motivate yourself first, or you just can't wait to learn and just want to start tearing into this field of psychology, then I recommend a video from the channel that you should go watch next as an introduction to this topic. The video is called, Let's Settle This. Which one creates motivation? Accomplished actions or unaccomplished actions? The link to the video is in my description, so if you're interested, please go check it out. Yeah, even when just looking at one task, whatever that may be, different people can be motivated because of different reasons. And some of these reasons for a motivation boost are difficult for other people to understand, and thus there isn't really like a one-size-fits-all rule to motivation boosting. This makes sense, right? This video I recommend uses science and psychology to talk about the main two motivation boosters that can motivate the greatest amount of different kinds of people. So of course it's not 100% versatile, but it is proven that it applies to most amount of people. And learning about this is important because whether you're like a manager of some kind and want to motivate your people to work on something, or if you're only trying to manage yourself, either way, you have to know this because otherwise you're going to be fruitlessly attempting to motivate people in the wrongest ways possible. And that's obviously wasteful because most likely those other people will not be motivated to give effort when all you need to do was a simple tweaking in how you motivate them. If you're interested in learning about this, you should definitely go check this video out. Additionally, I have some books you might want to read in the description. Today I'll be a little random with these books that I choose, but they're all related to science and psychology in some way. So I'll introduce one book from this list. One of the books I recommend today is called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. I've already talked about this book in many of my other videos, so I won't discuss the summary of it. You can just go watch some of my other videos that summarizes this book and uh, adds it as his recommendation. But what I want to emphasize here is about how you can use the knowledge you gain by reading this book into your own life. We all make mistakes, which often comes from a small difference in the way we think. And this tiny difference in thinking results in whether or not we win that competition or get promoted in that job or not, win the heart of that hottie or get slapped in the face. Pretty much everything you can think about life. And we humans are so susceptible to the biases that we face in life that often leads us astray or towards unintentional and undesired outcomes. And you can seriously study about how this whole thing works and what to do about it by reading this book. So that was my book recommendation. And with that, that was everything that I wanted to talk about in this video. So thank you all for watching. I also have many more videos about interesting science and psychology you can check out. So make sure to like this video and subscribe to Life study library. I've been your host, Lai Yosh, and I'll see you in another video. Later, Gators!